Well, good morning, Lakeview. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. Good to be with you this morning, whether you're in person or online. We're glad you're here. Welcome to this Sanctity of Life Sunday on this Martin Luther King Day weekend. Lakeview has always diligently strived to bring hope, love, and grace to Marion. We want to meet people with love first. Lakeview started the Pregnancy Help Center in 1992 and continues to support it to this day. We want to show our heart, love, and support for families and soon-to-be parents. Lakeview has shown many women in the community that we choose love through our Embrace Grace ministry by meeting women where they are and supporting them through the journey of pregnancy and beyond. We want to meet all situations and circumstances with love and grace. We want to meet expecting parents with love and grace. We want to meet abortion with love and grace. We want to be pro-love and pro-grace. For the next few minutes, we're going to honor the young lives that have been lost to abortion. By no means are we aiming to condemn anyone or shout about what we are against, but to proclaim what we are for, love. 
Love for all and grace for the aborted and those who have chosen abortion. Abortion has claimed the lives of more than 60 million babies in America since the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision to legalize abortion on demand in all 50 states. Each individual walking across the stage this morning represents the lives lost to abortion in the year of their birth. to show you Sing sweet lullabies Wipe your teary eyes Who could love you like this People say that I am brave but I'm not Truth is I'm barely before me because he loves you like this I will carry you while your heart beats here long beyond the empty cradle through the coming
Today is our second Sunday in our 21 days of prayer. Last week's theme was around our personal lives, and this week's theme is around the local church. So similar to how we went about it last week, some prompts will be put on the screen, and we will offer some times of silence for you to pray around that subject. So first, we're going to pray for the people of our church. In recognition of the God-given sacredness of all human life, regardless of age, skin color, skill, or family heritage, pray that we would be unified in love, in mission, and in mind. Now, I'll just pray for the ministries of our church. Pray that our outreach ministries, our school, and our counseling center would be worthy vessels for God's grace to pour out into our community. And finally, let's pray for the community around our church. Pray that God would transform Marion, Indiana and surrounding communities through racial reconciliation, justice, freedom from addiction, thriving families, and more.
Father, on this sanctity of life and Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend, we are reminded that all human life is valuable. Unborn or born, black, brown, white, yellow, or red, we're not valuable because of anything that we've done, but because we're made in your image. Lord, we pray that you would help us to lay down any times we might have looked on our brothers or sisters as worthless. Give us a passion for seeing people living together in unity. Give us a desire to stand up for those who are oppressed or don't have a voice of their own. Give us your love for all mankind. And Lord, we offer up our church, our school, and our counseling center to you. We recognize that at the end of the day, they're yours. We're only stewards. So as we reach out into the community through these ministries, would you help us to meet the needs of those we are uniquely equipped to meet? Help us to love on young moms through Embrace Grace. Help us to feed hungry families through Feed the Street. Help us to turn families to Jesus through our school. Help us to be a part of mental healing in our community through our counseling center. And Lord, all in all, we know that it is your desire that not only your church reflect your intentions, but also the whole world. So we lift up our community, Marion, Indiana, Grant County. We ask that you would heal our land, that you would pour out the grace and mercy that can only come from you on our hurting neighbors, that you would make us agents of your kingdom so that Marion and Grant County might become everything you ever dreamed of for it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. stand and sing this old hymn with us. I hear the Savior say Thy strength in need is so Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me thy all in all Jesus paid it all Jesus paid
today and in your presence all our fears are washed away and washed away I wasn't going to say anything, Pastor. I was just going to sing and then go sit down and be quiet. But they gave me a microphone and then they told the band director to not talk. That's crazy. You can clap. You're allowed to smile. Right? I, I don't know. I'm in church. Church is supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be a drudge on your feet. It's supposed to recharge you. So it goes like this. And pray. Stay standing for the reading of the word of the Lord. It comes from Genesis 39, verses 1 through 12. And then we're reading from the New Living Translation. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. 
Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you and his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and would be a, it would be a great sin against God? She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he kept her out of her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, Come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, Lakeview Church. So excited to share with you today, and if you're here in the room or you're online, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here. We started a brand new message series last week called A Life That Makes a Difference. We've really been focused in here at Lakeview Church on the reality that we are an everyday church for everyday people where we strive to follow Jesus, live generously, and make a difference every single day. As we've been kind of jumping into that reality and really focusing in on that, we spent some time in the fall talking about what it looks like to follow Jesus, where we can experience forgiveness and where we can uh, find freedom. We spent some time talking about in the fall how to live generously, how to offer our lives fully to God. And we're spending this first month of the year really zeroing our attention in on this whole idea of what it looks like to make a difference. And as I've been preparing for this series over the last several months, I really uh, kind of dug into the life of Joseph. His story is found in Genesis chapters 37 through 50, and we're really studying the life of Joseph during the month of January. And as I was looking at the life of Joseph over the last several months, I wrote a definition from his life that I think really defines what it looks like for us to live a life that makes a difference. And this definition is going to be on the screen for you, and this is how I wrote it. A person lives a life that makes a difference when he or she recognizes his or her God-given purpose and is committed to live out that purpose with God's help over a lifetime. We kind of took that definition and went a step further to talk about what are the components of a life that makes a difference. If we were going to become people who live our lives in such a way to make a difference, what would the components need to be that would be a part of our lives that would make us those kind of people? And so we kind of wrote it as a formula. And we said that living a life that makes a difference really is a combination of these three components. We said that everybody needs to recognize their divine calling. And we made the point last week that everybody has a divine calling. Everybody does. This comes from God and every single person has one of these. You just have to recognize it and discover it and begin to live into it. We said that you take divine calling and you add to that personal commitment. Because it actually takes your commitment, your dedication, your devotion to live out that purpose so that that calling that God has given to each and every one of us can be fulfilled. It can be realized. It can, it can actually show up in the world like God intends it to show up. So it's divine calling and personal commitment. And then we talked about the fact that there's this reality that we need the divine call. We need personal commitment, but we also need God's help. 
And we need God's help over the course of our lifetime if, in fact, we're going to become everything that God wants us to be. We're simply not capable of doing everything that God has put us here to do if we try to do it in our own strength and in our own capacity. We need the help and the favor of God. And we said last week that this idea of God's help, God's favor, it's a gift, Right? There's not certain things that you can do to earn it. There's no way that you can manipulate God. There aren't levers that you can pull that will make God favor you. It's a gift of God's grace to your life. All we can do is position ourselves to receive it. And we said that we're going to spend the rest of this series really kind of focused in on what do we need to do to position ourselves to be people who receive God's help. Now, I want to just quickly review, because I know not everybody was here last week, and you can go back and watch last week's message. You can do that on our website or on our YouTube channel, and we would encourage you to do that if you need to catch up. But I want to give you just a quick review of last week's message. We talked about last week this whole idea of divine calling, and this idea of divine calling really is at the intersection between our primary call and our secondary call. And we talked about last week that our primary call as God's people is to make disciples, right? We looked at some of the very last words of Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples, right? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you even to the very end of the age, That is our calling, every single one of us, to make disciples. But we said that while that that, that call is common to all of us, we, we share that same call, each and every one of us has a secondary call, and, and that secondary call is what we called your personal sweet spot. This is, this is who God made you uniquely to be and you figuring out who God has made you to be and then living into that personal sweet spot that God has designed you for. And when you actually know your personality and your passions and your gifts and your skills and your abilities and you spend most of your life operating in the way that God designed you, you actually are more fulfilled, you're more effective And God can actually begin to give you a platform for influence, not for your own name, but for his work in the world. And I love the prayer of uh, Soren Kierkegaard. He said, and now, Lord, with your help, I shall become myself. That's a great prayer. One that we ought to pray because we spend a lot of time trying to be like other people. And we're always a poor imitation. But when we learn to become exactly who God has made us to be, we actually can make the contribution God wants us to make to the world. And what we said last week is that when you find your personal sweet spot and you lean into that, at that moment when you can use your personal sweet spot, your secondary calling, to fulfill your primary calling of making disciples, it's right at that intersection where your divine calling is found. Every single person is created by God. Ephesians 2.10. For God has created us in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for you to do. You find what God created you to do, and you do that. And while you're doing that, remember your primary calling to make disciples. And when you use your secondary calling to make disciples... That's when God's kingdom begins to advance, and that's when your life is used to make a difference. Now, we talked about divine calling, and we talked about personal commitment. Remember, we talked about Joseph, how he got this dream from God about what his life was going to be about, and he was really focused on it, so much so that he started sharing it. And instead of finding encouragement and help and support, he found rejection, right? That happens sometimes when you share what God's laid on your heart to do. You think you're going to find support and encouragement and excitement. And what you find is resistance and rejection. That's what happened to Joseph. Remember, they they actually put him in a pit and they faked his death and they sold him into slavery. And he finds himself in a foreign land owned by another human being. 
and spending the rest of his life in the service of that person who purchased him. Joseph has a God-given dream, but it doesn't seem to be going the way he wants it to go or even the way he thinks God wants it to go. And yet, even in that, he continues to be committed to being a faithful servant of God wherever he finds himself. And when he's falsely accused and thrown into prison, again, you'd think it'd be time to say, man, it's just not my day. And he would just turn away from God. But that's not what he does. He stays committed. And in fact, at every turn in Joseph's life, and there were lots of turns, lots of setbacks, lots of challenges, lots of failures. Even in the midst of all of that, Joseph stays committed. He has a divine call he has personal commitment, and he has God's help. At every twist and turn in the story, whether he was in the pit or at Potiphar's house, whether he was in prison or in Pharaoh's palace, at every single turn, we read the same phrase over and over and over again in Joseph's life. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And because the Lord was with Joseph, Joseph was blessed. And not only was Joseph blessed, but the people that came into Joseph's circle of influence were also blessed. Because God was helping Joseph. And, and by helping Joseph, he was positioning him to be right where God wanted him to be so that the dream that God had placed on Joseph's life could be fulfilled. And we're spending the rest of this series just asking a really, really important question that I think comes right out of Joseph's story. What does it take for us to be the kind of people that the Lord wants to be with? We spend a lot of time in, in the church talking about what it takes for us to be with God, right? Carve out space, right? Some of you have been carving out space at 6.30 in the morning uh, during Monday to Friday to be here in the sanctuary, and you come in, and your eyes are kind of dreary, and, and you're like, but the, I'm carving out space, right? And, we, and that's good. We ought to do that. Listen, we ought to find time in our lives to be with God, but an, an equally important and maybe even more important question is what does it take to be the kind of people that the Lord wants to be with? Because when God looked at Joseph's life, God said, I want to be with him. I want to put my hand on his life. I want to I wanna put my favor on his life. I want to help him because I've got a dream that I want to be fulfilled through his life. And so I'm just going to let my favor rest on him and I'm going to use him and I'm going to do work in him and I'm going to change him and I'm going to empower him and bless him and use him for my glory and for my honor. And I think we ought to ask ourselves the question, what does it take to be those kind of people? And we're going to do that this week and the next couple of weeks. So we're going to talk about one of the characteristics that I think needs to be a part of our lives in order to be the kind of people that God wants to be with. And this first characteristic that we're going to talk about today is unwavering integrity. Unwavering integrity. And we're going to look really at Joseph's story because the reality is, is that Joseph gets sold into slavery by his own family. They fake his death and then they send him to a foreign land and they even make some money off of him and then they, they ship him off to Egypt where he is purchased by a man named Potiphar. Potiphar is a captain of the guard in the Egyptian army and he purchases Joseph to work as a slave in his household. And when Joseph finds himself in that situation, make no mistake about it, Joseph's not happy. He's not excited about these turn, this turn of events in his life. He doesn't believe that this is clearly a sign of God's blessing. No, this is hard. This is difficult. This is, this is not the way Joseph would write his story. And, and I just want to say, sometimes we find ourselves in seasons and situations where it's not the way we would write our story. And sometimes we give up on God's purpose in our lives because we think things aren't going the way we want them to. 
And I want to just encourage you today. Sometimes when you find yourself in a hard season, it's not because God's purpose has been short-circuited. It's because God is working out his purpose. And we get in our modern mindset that pain and hardship and difficulty is bad, so we run away from it. But what if God is saying, no, just stay in it, because right in that difficulty and hardship and challenge is where I want to bless you and shape you and position you for everything that I want to accomplish in and through your life. I think we short circuit what God wants to do in and through us because we run away from the hard places. We can't imagine a God who would let us experience something hard. Except sometimes it's the hard thing that actually puts us right where we need to be. And wouldn't it be a shame if we spent our entire lives running away from hard things only to find out at the end that we totally missed what God had for us because we needed the hard things for God's purpose to be fulfilled in and through our lives. Joseph is sold into slavery and he goes to Potiphar's house and he serves there with distinction. Look at Genesis 39 verse 2. This is what it says. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Joseph doesn't say, man, woe is me. This is not God's plan for me. I'm going to just give half an effort here, or I'm going to drag my feet or not do my best. No, Joseph just rolls up his sleeves and says, this is what God's given me to do right now, and I'm going to do it well to the very best of my ability, and I sense that the Lord is with me, and I'm just asking God to bless the work of my hands. Because Joseph wasn't working for Potiphar. Joseph was working for the Lord. And some of you find yourself in a situation where you have someone in your life who's over you in authority and you think to yourself, I don't like working for this person. Can I just remind you, you don't work for them. You work for the Lord. And if you recognize that you work for the Lord in that situation, how would you work? Do that. Because working that way in that situation might be the way for you to be elevated out of that hard situation that you're in. So instead of complaining, just serve as unto the Lord. And let God use you in the middle of that situation to be a light for his name. Now, Now Millie and Kirk are with me. I don't know about the rest of you. You might just be saying, is this message over yet? But Millie and Kirk, thank you. Just keep it, just keep it coming. Just keep it coming. You're encouraging me. Joseph served with distinction in Potiphar's house in the middle of a hard situation. And watch what happens, verses three and four. Potiphar noticed this. Potiphar noticed this. And look at what Potiphar recognizes. He realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And it didn't take Potiphar long to figure this out. He's like, huh, I got this slave who comes from a foreign land and he's pretty good at what he does. And there's benefit that's coming now to my household. And so Potiphar says, if God is blessing this guy's life, I'm going to elevate him. Because what does Potiphar want? He doesn't want God's name to be glorified. He just wants to have a prosperous household. Potiphar might not be a great person, but he's not dumb. He says, man, Joseph is is getting it done and I'm gonna elevate this guy and give him more control and authority in my household. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. 
See, sometimes we don't ever get elevated into the places God wants us to be because we haven't been faithful with the little that we've been given to start with. If you want more responsibility, you got to be faithful with the responsibility you've already been given. Because the one who is faithful with little can be trusted with much. And there's a whole bunch of sermons right now that are just in my head that I want to just say right now, but I'm going to resist the urge. Because I think sometimes in life we just miss what God wants to do in our lives because we're so, so consumed with where we wish we were that we forget to be God's people where we are. Why would God take you where you wish you were if you can't do what he's put in front of you to do right now? Joseph serves with distinction. Potiphar recognizes it, puts him in control. And look at verses five and six. This is where you see God's help and favor on Joseph's life. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless, not Joseph. The Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. What if there are places and pockets in our society today that would experience the blessing of God if we were the kind of people that God was ready to be with, ready to help, ready to favor, and we could go into those places and those places would experience the blessing and favor of God, not for their sake, but for ours. What if we, as God's people, lived our lives in such a way that God used us for the good of our city, for the good of our county? What if the blessing of God wasn't just something for us to contain and hold and enjoy? What if it was something that God was intending to pour out on our community? See, Potiphar was blessed for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and his livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph even more control. All administrative, complete administrative responsibility, the text says, over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. I mean, some things you can't delegate, right? Joseph served with distinction. God was blessing him. Potiphar recognizes this, elevates him, gives him complete control. And it's right at this moment in the story where Joseph now is starting to kind of get his legs under him. I mean, think about it. Ever since God gave him a dream, everything has gone wrong. But now he starts to come into his own. Right? He's got responsibility, increased influence. He's got people now who serve under his leadership. He's been promoted, not, not just once, but a couple of times. And his authority has expanded. And this foreigner in a foreign land finds himself in a place where God has now elevated him and given him power and authority and influence and recognition. And it's right at that moment that temptation comes. Don't think for a minute that just because God's favor is resting on your life, that that means you are immune to the work of the enemy. In fact, I would contend that right in that moment when God's favor is most being poured out in your life, that at that moment you are most susceptible to an attack from the enemy. That's why when I talk to other pastors and churches who want to go into 21 days of prayer, I just say to them, hey, just so you know, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you think you're going to go into 21 days of prayer and God's just going to pour out his blessing and the enemy's going to say, yeah, I'm just going to sit this one out, you are so wrong. You are so wrong. Because what I know is that every time we've done 21 days of prayer since I've been your pastor is that those 21 days and the days following 21 days of prayer are probably the moments when the enemy works harder in my life than at any other point in the year. 
Why do you think that is? Because the enemy does not want God's purposes to go forward. And so Joseph is in this place where God's favor is being poured out and, and it's being poured out not just on him but on Potiphar's house and it's right at that moment that Potiphar's wife is like, I kind of like this guy. He's well built. That, I'm, that's what my wife says about me. He's well built. Sorry, I, yeah, you just got to get these things in every once in a while. Right? <laughs> Potiphar's wife looks at Joseph and says, he's handsome and he's well-built and I want him for myself. And she actually tells Joseph, Joseph, come and sleep with me. Now, I, I want you just to, to just pause for a moment right here and put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Because if you think about Joseph's life, he's got he's had a God-given dream. And, and as soon as he shares it, he's rejected. His family decides to fake his death, sell him into slavery. Nothing in Joseph's life has gone the way it's supposed to go. And Joseph very easily in this moment could start the justifications. Woe is me. I had this dream, but it's been short-circuited. I'm in a foreign land. I could never do what God's called me to do anyway because of where I'm at and, and, and the fact that I'm in slavery and I can't get out and I don't see a way forward. I deserve this. See, sometimes people, people make those kind of justifications when temptation comes their way. They think to themselves, I deserve this. Don't you know how hard it's been for me? In another, in another sense, Joseph could take a whole nother tack altogether and say, you know what? It's not that, not that things have been bad, but things are going pretty good. I'm somebody. And because I'm somebody, I ought to be able to have what I want in this moment. And they could, he could justify it that way. He could decide to shift the blame entirely. After all, he could say, I'm just a slave and she's kind of in charge because this is her house too. I ought to just give in. Or he could just decide in this moment to just be purely selfish, to say, I've worked hard, I've earned this. And he could just go ahead and give in to the temptation. You see, here's what I think we do in our lives when temptation comes our way. We rationalize, we make excuses, we, we, we present all kinds of justifications because at the core of our being, in the moment of temptation, we have to make a decision to either do as we please or do as God says. And there's a huge part of us that just wants to do as we please. And so we can find all kinds of arguments to make a case to say, yeah, I should do this and then to give in. And people do this all the time. Some of you did it this week. Temptation came your way and you made a justification for why you ought to do it and then you just decided in that moment, instead of doing as God says, you decided, I'm gonna do as I please. And you went the other way. Joseph, though, doesn't do any of those things. Joseph looks at the temptation that's in front of him. And, and in that moment, in that instant, he decides, I'm going to do as God says. Maybe all those thoughts went through his mind. We don't know. All we know is that when we read the story is that Joseph, in verse 8, refused Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? And then look at this last phrase. It would be a great sin against God. Joseph in his life said, it doesn't matter how much I want this. It doesn't matter how much I desire it or even how much I think I deserve it. God has said, this is not acceptable. Therefore, I will not do it because if I do it, I am sinning against God. 
Listen, in our culture today, we have a hard time believing that God would tell us that we can't have what we want. We assume that if we want it, that it must be somehow the way God made us. And therefore, we ought to have what we want because we cannot imagine a God who would say, don't eat from that tree. Can't imagine that. And so we just justify so we can do as we please. We basically set a course for our lives and then we make God in our image so we can feel good about the sin that we are engaged in. But what if, what if God actually knew what was best? And what if we actually came to a place in our lives where we said, it doesn't matter what I want, it only matters what God says. Because I don't belong to myself anymore, I belong to the God who paid the price for my life. And so I'm gonna submit myself to him as my Lord because at the end of the day, it's not happiness that I'm after, it's holiness. Keep it coming, Millie. Keep it coming. You see, Joseph decides to do as God says because he belongs to God. And he's not going to make justification so he can do as he pleases. And it's at this point in Joseph's story that we read that she doesn't just tempt him one time and then move on when he says no. She keeps putting pressure on him. She keeps coming at him over and over and over again. You see, sometimes temptation comes and you just refuse it and that's it. And you move on. Except most of the time, that's not how it works. It just keeps coming. It's relentless. It, it won't let go. It's stubborn which means you don't just have to refuse temptation one time, you gotta keep refusing it over and over and over again. When you refuse it one time, that's integrity. When you have to keep refusing it, that's when you determine whether or not you have unwavering integrity. Because see, if, if, you just, if you just say no one time, but the next time you're like, you know, I said no last time, I think I'm okay to say yes this time, that's not unwavering integrity. That's fleeting integrity. And God's looking for people who will be people of unwavering integrity in our lives. These are the kind of people that God will be with. People that when he looks down, if he were to choose to pour out his favor, he's going to look for people who will do as he says, not just as they please. Those are the kind of people he's looking for. And this brings us really to our main idea for today. If we want to be positioned to receive the gift of God's favor, we have to be people of unwavering integrity. We have to set our resolve. Now listen, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. Thank you, John, for laughing that. Because I, I, I was looking for a laugh there, but you were the only one who got it. So thank you. Sometimes you hear what I'm not saying, and I'm not saying that it's up to you to go out and live a life of holiness, because I'm just going to tell you right now, you can't do that in your own strength. You need the help of God to make you holy and to empower you to live holy. That's the call of God on our lives, to yield ourselves to him and stay in step with his spirit so that we can have unwavering integrity. That's the call of God on our lives. But that's the kind of people God's looking for in this world. And I'm, I'm calling you, I'm challenging you to step into that in 2022, to say, God, I am setting my intention to be a person of integrity, to be a person that, that keeps your word, to be a person that submits to your lordship. And that honors your plan and your purpose for my life. I'm calling you into that. And even as you hear that this morning, some of you I know are sitting here and this is the conversation you're having in your mind. Yeah, but I'm not a person of integrity. 
I recognize the call of God to be a person of integrity. I know that that's what God wants for me. But when I just look back even over the last week of my life, I can tell you I'm not a person of integrity. I know the conversation you're having in your mind right now. Because it's just part of our human existence. We, we come to moments in our lives and we realize that even though we want to be a person of integrity, that there are places and seasons and moments where we step away. If you've been following the 21 Days of Prayer videos, you know on Monday I talked about the life of David. And David is an interesting character in the Old Testament because you've got, you've got Joseph who, who has every reason to give in to temptation. I mean, if you're talking about rationalizations and justifications, he's got every reason to give in to temptation, but he doesn't. And then you got David, right? King over Israel, great military leader with tons of success and spiritual leader, man after God's own heart. He writes psalms which shape the, the worship life of Israel and continue to shape our lives even to this day. So you've got Joseph, every reason to give in and he doesn't. You've got David, every reason not to give in. And what does David do? He gives in. This happens to our lives. We, we want to be people of integrity, but we give in to temptation and we separate ourselves from God's plan and God's purpose and God's path. What do we do if this morning we hear the call for unwavering integrity and yet when we look at our lives, we see ourselves and we know we're not who God wants us to be. What do we do? If you're not familiar with David's story, David as king is on his palace rooftop and he's looking over his kingdom and he sees a woman bathing and he determines in his heart that she's beautiful and he wants her for himself even though she is not his wife. In fact, she's married to another man, a leader in David's army. This is wrong on so many levels. And yet David wants her and he gives into the temptation, sends his servants, go and get her for me. And they bring her to him and he sleeps with her. He doesn't even try to resist the temptation. He gives into it immediately. And, and he tries to sweep it under the rug. He tries to try to, try to kind of orchestrate the situation around it so no one will know the wrong that he's done. But, but God knows, and that's enough. Because God sends Nathan to David. And, and I love how Nathan goes to David and says, hey, David, we got this guy in our kingdom, and he slept with this other man's wife, and then he had the man killed. And what should we do with a guy like that, David? And David says, well, we ought to kill him. And then Nathan says, you're the guy. You're the guy, David. And, and it's in David's story that we see someone who gives in to temptation, but it's also in David's story that we see how to reset our integrity. Because when Nathan says, David, you're the guy, do you know what David does? He doesn't justify, he doesn't rationalize, and he doesn't make excuses. You know what David does? David confesses his sin. David says, I've sinned against God. And then David writes Psalm 51, which is perhaps one of the best and most articulate prayers of confession ever written. And in David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51, we find the pathway back to reset our integrity. And I wanna just share these steps with you because some of you today need to reset your integrity. And I just want to let you know, you can reset it back to perfect. You can't do it in your own strength, but God, through his grace, can do that in a moment if you just let him. So you think to yourself, I could never be like Joseph to be a person of unwavering integrity. Oh, yes, you can. With God's help, you can. God can reset your integrity and he can empower you to live a life of holiness and you can become the person that God wants you to be. And in just a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to reset your integrity. But this is what we learn from David's prayer in Psalm 51, that, that when we find ourselves in a place where our integrity needs to be reset, the first thing that we have to do is just simply look at our sin and admit it. 
We have to look at our sin and we have to admit it. I'm gonna invite Christina to come and invite her just to, to play because we're gonna move to a moment of commitment here pretty quickly. Look at what it says in Psalm 51, verses three and four. For I recognize, this is David talking now, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You'll be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. What's David doing? He's just simply saying, you're, you're right, God. That's what confession is. It's just simply saying, God, what you say about me is right. I have sinned against you. And if you're sitting here today and you think my, my integrity needs to be said, you already know why. I just want to encourage you to, to just admit it, just to say, God, I, you're right. And, and just a hint, he's always right. Just agree with him. Admit it, it's the first step back. And then after you admit it, you've got to do the second thing, which is to receive God's grace. David, when he prays, he says, cleanse me, wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. First John says it this way, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Admit where you have sinned and then receive God's grace. And then thirdly, go a different direction. You can't just say today, I know that I've, I've, I've messed up. God, forgive me. And then walk out of here this afternoon and mess up again and think to yourself, I'll just take care of that next Sunday. Listen, a lot of people do that. I just want to tell you right now, God does not want to keep just forgiving you over and over and over again. He will. You confess your sins. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive your sins. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But can I tell you today, God doesn't want to just forgive you. God actually wants to set you free. Because God wants you to live a life of unwavering integrity. So, so we learn to go a different direction. This is why David prays in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. God, God I used to be rebellious. I don't want to be rebellious anymore. I want to be loyal and faithful to the God who called me. So this morning, uh, I want to just invite you to reset your integrity. And I'm going to ask you to do something that, that's kind of bold. But I just, want to, I just want to kind of set the stage by just letting you know that, that in this place, there's no condemnation. Because what we know is that we are all people who are in need of God's grace. And if you think you don't need God's grace, please just see me after church. Because we're all people who at one time or other in our lives need to reset our integrity. So I'm actually gonna invite you in a moment to come to the altar if you just say, you know what, God? I want a clean beginning today. I wanna be made clean. I wanna be washed. I wanna, be, I wanna get a new start because I want to be a person of integrity. And God, there are things in my life that maybe don't line up exactly the way I think you want them to. And so this morning, what I want to invite you to do is stand. So go ahead and stand. And I'm going to pray for us. And then we're just going to wait just for a few moments. And if you are a person today who says, you know what? I want to reset my integrity. I'm asking you to step out from where you're at, make your way to this altar. Again, no condemnation, only grace, only love, only acceptance, and only help for you to step into the forgiveness that God has for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, God, right now in this very moment, I'm praying that you would make your voice the loudest thing in this room. And if there is anybody in this room who has stepped off of the path, even if it's just a little step, or God, maybe it's a lot of steps. Maybe it's big steps away. God, it doesn't matter. One step brings them back. 
So would you help them in this moment to have the courage and boldness to say, God, I want to be a person of unwavering integrity and I want a fresh start at that journey today. Give us the courage and the boldness for that. And so this morning still with heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If you're here and you just want to reset your integrity, we would love nothing more than to just meet you at this altar and pray with you. So we're just going to wait for a couple of moments. We won't wait long. So if you're coming to the altar, come now. We want to pray with you. And we want to encourage you today on this journey. anybody praying alone. So if you see somebody praying by themselves, just put a hand on their shoulder. Just encourage them. Anybody else, don't don't miss this chance. Don't miss this moment. If God's speaking to your heart, and you just think, you know what, I, I need the help of God this morning and I don't want to miss this moment. Just step out. No condemnation here. Only grace. Only community. Only help. Church, let's pray together. God, we echo the words of David. Create in all of us, Lord, a clean heart. And renew within us a loyal spirit, God. You're looking for people who are loyal to your name. You are a jealous God. You will not share our affections with other gods and you want our total devotion to you. So God, would you create in us a clean heart? Would you renew a loyal spirit inside of your people? Would you make us people of integrity and holiness? Not in our own strength, because we can't do it on our own. Lord, would you empower us? Would you, would you strengthen us? Would you quicken us for, for a life of holiness in, in a world that, that doesn't care about holiness? Lord, let us be the kind of people that that when you look down on us, you find the kind of people that you can be with, the kind of people you can help and favor because because we look like you. We reflect your character in this world and we are 100% sold out to you. God, please, please do that work in our lives. And God, when we find ourselves in tempting situations, would you give us the ability to see that moment for what it is, a choice between doing as we please or doing what you say, and may that loyal spirit that you've put inside of us choose to do what you have said in that moment. God, we are not here today just asking for forgiveness, though we are asking for that. Lord, we're asking for freedom. We're asking for help. We're asking for strength and power to live the kind of lives that you want us to live. So God, do your work, not just for these at the altar, though I pray especially for them. Meet them here in this place of prayer. Pour out your spirit on them in a fresh and new way. and Set them free, God, and reset their integrity and help them live their lives fully for you. And God, may that be true for all of us. Make us the kind of people that honor your name. For what you do, God, we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor.
And we pray it today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, can we just take a moment and give God praise for the way that he's working in our midst this morning? Let's give him praise. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for that hard word, but good word. A few things we want to make you aware of as we wrap up today before we send you out. First of which if you, is if you're a guest with us today, whether you're in person or online, we just want to say we're glad that you're here. And we want to express that with a gift. So if you would scan that QR code that's on your bulletin or text the word welcome to 765 222 5937. You'll get a link to a communication card. You can fill that out and then go to that desk straight away in the back and you can receive your gift. If you're online, don't worry. We'll get in touch with you this week to make sure that you get your gift. And for our members, it's that time of year again. I just want to remind you that membership reaffirmation is upon us. So those forms will be avail made available next week. So look for those. And then finally, our small group signups are being released today. So small groups will start on the end of the month, January 30th, but I want to tell you about some different small groups that we have in this time. We have our normal ones as we've gone about, but our discipleship curriculum that we've been in the process of making is finally ready to go. So with that, we have some discipleship pathway specific small groups. And here's the kicker. They're only four weeks long. So if you're worried about time commitment, but you want to grow deeper with Jesus, you want to feel challenged in your relationship with him, this is the group for you. So make sure you look at those on our website or at the kiosks on your way out. And there's also prayer groups for those of you who'd be interested in that on these 21 days of prayer and a myriad of other options. Now, would you stand with me and receive the benediction, the words of blessing as we leave this place. May the Lord empower you to endure the enemy's temptations, and may he make you a person of integrity. You're sent out.